mention. Uh, my other hat is that I have a corporate role at the Deseret Management Corporation. And our, uh, our mission statement is to help be the voices of truth and light to millions of people, hundreds of millions around the world. But there's a lot of those voices here. And you are, I believe, if you will, probably about the same thing, trying to bring truth to subjects that are complicated and complex. So it makes full sense to us to be here today. But what we want to do today is do some work. And, and building off of Anna's welcoming remarks, I have a few key questions for you. Because my role today is to remind you that you have something to do. So why am I here? Some of you are speaking. Some of you are here to network with others. But each of you has a job, because imagine you were sitting in a headquarters of one of the world's leading brands on insight, research, and data on a day when something would be released that probably hasn't been done before. And you were doing it at a high floor of an iconic building in one of the capitals of thought leadership in the world. That's you. That's a lot of responsibility to be sitting in a place like this with partners like Gallup on a day like today, right before an international day where an issue is going to be discussed. So your kids are going to ask you someday, and your grandkids are going to ask you someday, you were there, what did you do about it? Let me tell you a story, and I hope that this will help frame a little bit about how we're thinking about AI and this whole idea of well-being in the age of AI. Let me tell you this story because I think it might resonate with some of you. Do you remember that thing called the pandemic? Yep, it's still very much with us in some ways, as Anna mentioned. Well, I remember those first early days, and I was in front of a computer like this, and I was having one of 12 hours of meetings, like I'm sure you were too, and someone sent me a link that I wasn't familiar with on some platform I've never heard of. It wasn't Zoom, it wasn't Teams, it was something else. And I couldn't figure out how to turn off the camera. I'll never forget this moment. Were you, have you ever been there where you're sitting there and just madly trying to figure out how do I turn off the camera, how do I turn off the camera, how do I turn off the camera? And I'm speaking to my computer, I'm talking to my computer, I'm trying to negotiate with my computer about how to get the camera off to do something basic in my life, which is now intrinsically connected with technology. Unbeknownst to me, my young daughter was standing next to me, comes over and takes a piece of sticky tape and a piece of paper and puts it right over the camera and says, Dad, just do that. Now, I'm not trying to make light of a, of a situation in a world in which there are grave problems, many of which Anna mentioned. Violence, we're not meeting the sustainable development goals, inequity problems. But that lesson taught me that two things happened. The solution, most obvious, was right in front of my face. And I had not thought to ask someone younger than me. It would have been humiliating to ask my younger daughter to help me with the computer, right? I'm, I'm prideful. I know better. I'm the adult in the room. And there was a solution right next to me. Not all of them are high tech in the age of AI. Some of them don't have to be high tech. Are we so worried about being modern that we're forgetting to be meaningful? Are we so worried about being modern that meaningful is escaping us? And are we so worried about being modern that the meaningful, the solutions-based, might actually already be with us or within us? Today we're going to hear from some of those things, where in our communities and in our cities, where in some of our traditions where we have these abilities and these tools to actually transcend some of the problems in front of us and find out what is already within us so that well-being can truly be a part of our reality and future generations. Now, the data is trying to tell us something. Are you hearing? Let's listen to the data that will be presented today. Let's sit and be present with some of the uncomfortable truths that are in it, including those that may be that you've been ignoring it, including those that say, just because I don't know how to speak about something, I don't. The data is trying to tell us that we as a society, when talking about well-being, we are siloed. We talk about a few certain things, but we need to be more comfortable with building fluidity and fluency so that I can talk about other things that are meaningful, true, endearing, and enduring in our life. Not just modern, but meaningful. And 
isn't it true that those solutions that are right in front of us, those things that are so obvious in an era of well-being, are most likely plural? They're going to involve people around us, our communities, in an era, and again, without sharing the data that will be uh, shared with you later on, in a time when people are lonely, isn't there an imperative to look at the plural? Where I can connect with you about something greater than just the two of us, where I can connect with my community about building towards some of those goals, and where it's okay for me to, in being in touch with you as an individual, talk about something that's greater than us, even the divine. So that is a big horizon for all of you today. That is a big job because you now are on notice. You're here at the headquarters of an important global leader getting some first of its kind data and what are you going to do with it? Our hope is that you will share it within your own organization. Our hope is that you will learn from the, the different speakers that are gonna be here today so that you can integrate something new. And much like you would at the top of what is essentially a very beautiful antenna, this building, we hope that you will broadcast. Now, I'm a media guy, so I love it. I also call on that sector and on me and on companies like ours who have been complicit in not talking enough about what it means to have human well-being. Too much depends on it. Now, I want you to think about the people who are in your life, who you know are part of this reality, your nieces, your nephews, yourself. And I want you to broadcast and talk in the areas that you can to say, it's not just okay to talk about this, it's imperative. I'll close with one final story, if that's all right. This story takes, it's another domestic, it's nothing lofty or nothing, nothing huge that's gonna win a Pulitzer anytime soon, but it's my story and I'm gonna share it with you as friends. A few uh, months back, we were part of a charity donation drive for food for victims of a humanitarian disaster. You know the thing, right? The people at the supermarket who say, we need cans of tomatoes, we need cans of peaches or you know, condensed milk and we need flour, whatever it is. Have you ever seen those people at the supermarket who say, please come and bring us and put, us, put it into a box at the end? Those are interesting. I love them as an extrovert. I love those days because I get to talk to 100 people. But it's painful because you see some people who really want to give and others who don't. Well, in walks a man in his very beautiful sports car, living what I assumed was his very perfect life, with his very, you know, toned body and his very energetic outlook and his very expensive sunglasses. I gave him the piece of paper. I said, please consider giving to this box. I'm never going to see this guy. And I'm thinking to myself, he's never going to do anything. Well, half an hour later, as I'm sitting there, the man returns, and he has one of those, what I'll call the individual carts, you know, those small carts from the grocery store? And he has a very large cart from the grocery store, filled with interesting, fun things. And I said, well, I underestimated this gentleman. I said, thank you, sir. And I walked over and I took, started taking the small cart. And he stopped and he put his hand on mine, which is not something that people do that often, right? Stranger. I said, why would you assume I was giving you the small cart? So I think we should look around each other right now and look at your organizations. There is clergy here today, diplomatic representation, subject matter experts, data scientists, NGO leaders, members of the media. We need people who are there to give the big cart to a problem of well-being that will require everything. Let's not assume that people are cheap. Let's not assume that they don't want to give and be part of human well-being. Let's assume that their large cart, all that we have, our time, our treasure, our talent, our network, our influence, our belief, is part of what can make well-being happen. I believe, our organization believes, that each of you is divine and divine nature. We believe that everyone is a child of God. That means we can't do anything less then give it our all. Thank you for being here. Let's make today a day where we're not just being modern, but meaningful. Thank you.